Hello everyone, it's Kelly Brown here with you. It's March the 3rd. And today we have a really important video on vaccines for COVID-19 as they relate to public health policy and the opening of Ontario and of any province in the country. And before we get started, I'm gonna play you a few clips and we'll talk about them on the other side. The sooner we have needles in arms and the more needles in arms we have, the better off we all are. Wait for your vaccine, it's coming. We want everybody vaccinated, <clears throat> not just some. We want everybody done in a timely pa pattern. We have our ones with high risk, we're moving our way through that. Uh, we're heading well over 700,000 uh, vaccinations have been given already. When vaccine supply does become available, we are you know, able to um, quickly get needles into arms and into as many arms as is possible because we know that that's uh, a significant component of our response to COVID-19 and moving beyond uh, the pandemic, putting this pandemic behind us. So the clips I just played for you were of Dr. Williams, the chief doctor in Ontario, and Dr. Davila, the chief doctor in Toronto. And they were from the COVID-19 update on Monday, March the 1st, just a couple of days ago. So what I would like to talk about today is vaccine policy as it relates to public health policy. This isn't a video about vaccines themselves, whether or not they're safe, whether or not they work, whether or not you should take one or not take one. This is not about that. This is about public health policy as it relates to vaccines. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna go through some of the data sets which illustrate who is at most risk of a bad outcome of COVID-19 and look at it, look at the population and stratify the population into age groups so that we can show how much of the population makes up, is made up by the people who are at risk and how that should inform public policy for COVID-19 going forward. So we're going to ask some questions and then we're going to go through some additional clips from the two COVID-19 public health updates from the city of Toronto and the province of Ontario on Monday. So firstly, I'd like to just take you through some charts. Let's start with this very simple graph. This shows by age group, the percentage of the population in that age group, as well as the percentage of the COVID-19 deaths in each age group. And this data is from Ontario. And we see that about 12.2% of the population of Ontario are 70 plus years old. We also see that that age group represented 87.3 of all COVID-19 mortality. This is about 1.8 million residents. And to vaccinate this group, it would, it would take about 3.6 million doses. To vaccinate the other 88 percentage of the population, about 13 million people, it would require 26 million doses. This would eliminate about 13% of the mortality. And you might say, well, that's also still very important mortality. And you would of course be correct. Well, that other 13% of mortality that sadly occurred in Ontario occurred at a 0.22% case fatality rate, which is in line with other respiratory pathogens that circulate every year. Now, what about reductions in hospitalizations? Well, here we have some good data from Toronto. Same data with pop percentage of the population by age in the blue bar, and in the gray bar is the percentage of all hospitalizations by age group. And similarly, we can see that about 11% of the population in Toronto accounted for about 54% of all hospitalizations. So therefore, implicitly, if vaccines work, we would only have about 700,000 vaccine doses required to reduce overall hospitalizations by 54%. To reduce the other 45 or 46% of hospitalizations, we would need 5.4 million doses for the rest of the population in Toronto. Now you may say, well, that's 45% of all hospitalizations. That's still a large number. Well, as we saw similarly with deaths, the under 69 hospitalization rate is about 2.5% of all cases. Under 39, it is about a 0.9% case hospitalization rate. So sadly, there would still be hospitalizations existing in the 69 and under group, 
but the amount of doses that were, would be required is significantly greater for the second half of the reduction in hospitalizations versus the very efficient first half reduction focusing on the 70 plus. And recall that one of the original reasons for lockdown was to flatten the curve and to ensure the healthcare system was not overwhelmed. And so given that vaccinating 11% of the population in Toronto would result in a substantial reduction in overall hospitalization burden, this should allow us to ease restrictions. I posted this chart on Twitter the other day, which is a visual representation of COVID-19 mortality weekly for the entire pandemic, visually shown by age. The darker colors show higher values on a relative basis. And you can see that this is also stratified by age. So on the left, you have 90 plus, and it builds down to below 20. And there are three data sets here. The first is all COVID mortality at the top. The middle is community COVID-19 mortality, removing outbreak related cases. And the bottom is just all COVID cases in thousands. The darker the shade, the greater the number. And we can see that at the top, it's the 90s, 80s, and 70s groups that are mostly affected by mortality. But interestingly, at the very bottom, we see that younger ages typically have the highest numbers of infection, but are the lowest affected from severe outcomes. And I've put the case fatality rates on the right-hand side, so you can just very plainly see the low case, the extremely low case fatality rates for the younger ages. So as you can see, all of this is suggestive that in order to make the greatest impact on morbidity and mortality hospitalizations of this disease, we need to target a fairly small percentage of the population with vaccines because the age groups that are much younger are simply at a much lower risk than the older ages. And once we have the older ages protected, assuming that vaccines are uh, work well in that age group, and that is a caveat, but assuming that works well, then we need to be able to open up society much sooner. So I'm going to play you a few more clips from the health updates on Monday, and we'll talk about it on the other side. So what's the objective? The science tells us we need to achieve herd immunity through mass vaccination. In other words, we need over 70% of the population to get vaccinated to truly beat this virus. So we need a vaccine plan that targets people everywhere, where you live and where you work. We are partnering with community agencies and local neighborhood leaders on the ground in every corner of our city in order to reach every resident in our city. This will be the largest vaccination effort in the history of the city of Toronto. And I am very confident we will be able to meet this challenge. I know people are tired of the pandemic and I want it to be over and they all want it to be over. Everybody wants it to be over. The vaccines represent the best and the ultimate weapon in fighting COVID-19 and defeating it. It is why almost all of our long-term care and retirement home residents have been fully vaccinated. I mean, we would like to have everyone vaccinated by the, in the summer, if not sooner, uh, in there. If, if people are vaccinated, then the risk of obtaining it from someone else becomes less concerning. If we eliminate, uh, grade down our uh, cases of mortality and morbidity, and so our hospitalizations go down, uh, it'd be a much a different setting. Vaccination will be vital to countering the continued spread of COVID-19 in any form. And today, I will describe for you the role of Toronto Public Health in vaccination delivery. As an intervention, the case for vaccines is clear. I've said before, and am happy to say again, that here in Toronto, the reduction of the spread in long-term care and retirement settings tells us all we need to know about the capacity of vaccines to substantially reverse the threat of COVID-19. Because what we want to do is to try and uh, decrease the spread from person to person as much as possible. Right now, we know that some of the vaccines have a great impact on reducing uh, morbidity and mortality, but we're not sure yet if it decreases totally transmission. So you can very plainly see that the messaging from the public health officials does not seem to take into consideration the differing levels of risk in various age groups. There, you've heard Councillor Cressy say that we will need 
herd immunity from vaccines, which will take about 70% of the population to be vaccinated. And from the charts that we looked at, be at before, that doesn't doesn't quite stand to reason, or at least we need to ask the question why it makes sense to do that. And the same thing from Mayor Tory and Dr. Davila and Dr. Williams, the same message that mass vaccination, getting everyone and everybody vaccinated is the imperative here. And it doesn't make sense to me. And so these are the questions that we should be asking because this obviously is going to have a real impact on when we can get back to normal. And it seems to me that given the delays in vaccine rollouts, that getting back to normal is still a long ways off. And it doesn't seem to make sense, especially given that Dr. Williams has said that we have vaccinated almost everyone in long-term care homes and are making great progress in the at-risk ages. So what's left over once that's finished and it's close to being finished, we have a population left over of people who are at much less risk of actually a bad outcome from COVID-19. Now, another issue that you heard Dr. Williams talk about is the issue of transmission. So if one of the arguments is that we need to vaccinate everyone in the population to stop transmission upwards into older ages, well, it is really clear from Dr. Williams' admission that we still don't know whether or not vaccines efficiently stop transmission. If you couple that with the fact that we have made great progress in vaccinating our most vulnerable, then I'm asking the question of why do we need, why does the rest of the population need to wait for a reopening? So I hope you found this video informative and I hope you feel like you have a new set of questions to ask of our public health officials and elected officials, because it seems to me that the reopening of Ontario should be very soon at hand, given the data that we just went through. So thank you everybody for watching, be well, and we'll see you soon.